This week we learned that Berkshire Hathaway bought in some ways big into the financial sector and cut their losses. They sold some banks and they bought more. We need to talk about which ones they sold, which ones they bought, and what it actually tells us about banking in the US and the direction of the economy and the market. Stick around. Hey everybody, RC Peck here with Fearless Wealth, and this is my weekly video to help people retire strong. Now, I give information not for information purposes. The main thing I really want people to understand is you own the strategy, not the symbol. And we're gonna talk about that over and over again today because we're gonna talk about Berkshire Hathaway, right? A lot of people talk about that company, but they don't get it's their approach, it's their strategy. It's not what they own, it's how they own it. And it's the same thing with retirement. If you're just gonna have a buy and hold or buy and forget, you don't need an advisor. But if you actually want to retire strong, then there are different things you have to be doing and most big box advisors are not gonna do it. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Let's right now talk first about Berkshire Hathaway. They came out with their 13F, so this tells the world what they bought or sold in the first quarter. They have about 45 days from the close of Q1, close of any quarter to release this document. So I wanna talk about what they bought and what they sold. So let's get to that. Then I also wanna talk about Taiwan. And you're, you'll see the lead in we have to Taiwan. And then after Taiwan, let's talk about Sam Zell, if you don't know him. He is really connected to real estate. He's done a lot more than just real estate, but that's probably what he's most known for. He passed away today as of this recording. I'm recording this on Thursday and he died today on Thursday too. So I want to talk about him and what we can learn from him. Okay, let me pop over to the charts. Okay, so first let's just talk about this. So as I said to you before, Berkshire Hathaway came out with their 13F, which tells us what they bought or sold in Q1. I want to focus on a couple things here. And I know there's a lot of charts, uh, a lot of... Um, companies on here where some of them, they added positions, some of them, they reduced their positions. What I'm most interested in was their initial new positions. So they bought into Capital One Financial, COF, and I'll talk about that. They now own about 2.3% of Capital One's float, the amount of shares that are out in the market. And they completely got out of US Bank and the Bank of New York Mellon. Right, so they sold completely out of two banks. They initiated a new position, not in a new bank, but in Capital One Financial Corp. So they did not buy more banks. Now they did add more to Bank of America and they did add more to Citigroup, but not in any meaningful way. So let's look to the price chart. Let's give the screen as much space as we can. Okay, so this is Capital One Financial Group. Okay, now the 13F talks about this period right here. I think your brain can probably see where the buying was done. My bet is the buying was done between say the first of the year and maybe February 5th, February 6th. I believe that's probably where Berkshire bought their, what, 9.9 .9 million shares. I'm going from memory, 9.9. .9. Um, it's got to be right there. Now, here's what's interesting. Now, let's go to U.S. Bank. So look at U.S. Bank here. Here's U.S. Bank during the same period. So let's just show you this. Okay, that's Q1 for U.S. Bank. It's very like you can probably see where they got out of their position completely too, where the, the stock really, really dumped. So they got out of U.S. Bank completely. Now, I've talked about U.S. Bank many times. It's the fifth largest bank in the U.S. based on deposits. Berkshire said, no, thank you. I'm out. That's not a good sign. It probably doesn't mean the banking, whatever this is going to be called, looking back on it in one or two or five years, let's just say the banking crisis right now. Though people have said it's not a banking crisis because J.P. Morgan's okay and B of A is okay and Wells is okay. And Citigroup is okay. All right, whatever. Um, I don't agree with that. But here is U.S. Bank not looking good. 
Berkshire Hathaway got out of 100% of their position. And let me go back. And then they moved and opened up a new position in Capital One Financial. So the news came out, what, I think on the 15th, you can see if you look right in here, um, Capital One popped up. So it's up about since the news came out, Capital One's up about maybe 10 or 11% since May 15th, which is when they had, that was the last day they had to submit their their forms to the SEC. So we'll watch Capital One. Um, I don't know if there was a problem with it before. I would say there wasn't. And that's why Berkshire bought 2.3% uh, of the float and why they bought, again, I'm going from memory, I think it's 9.9 .9 million shares. Um, but yeah, so they added to this and they moved out of a bank. Yes, they added a little bit more to Bank of America. So let's just quickly look at that. That doesn't look good. It's below its pre-COVID high. So that's also, that's a, I think it's a, kind of a go, no go point for every price chart. And they added a teeny tiny bit more to Citigroup. And wow, this company just looks horrible. I mean, there's the pre-COVID high way up there. Citigroup not only is below it right now, but spent most of 2022 and half of 2021 below that. So that's not good. And then let's look at the reaction to KRE, right? Because that's what we, that's one of the things I'm looking at a lot is just has this bottom, has it not bottom? Now, clearly KRE, regional bank ETF got excited. I think what they got excited about is they learned about Berkshire Hathaway's purchase of COF, COF and they're seeing that as more positive than the complete dumping of US bank. So people see what they want to see, but it, it kind of tells us where we are. And they, they the market sees this as kind of more positive than, than not. So there's, there's that right now. So the market itself is saying, hey, Berkshire bought something. They're, they're leaning on that one. <laughs> and less on, they got completely out of the fifth largest bank in the US. Probably not a good sign. So still mixed, and that's the theme you're gonna hear from me throughout this call, this, this video, is there's a lot of mixed information going on out there. Um, Berkshire also got completely out of Bank of New York Mellon. They said, no thanks, we don't want anything to do with this company anymore, and guess what? Bank of New York Mellon is also below their pre-COVID high. So that's another negative, and yet KRE itself was more excited that there were some purchases than anything else. Um, by the way, Capital One is not a bank, so it doesn't even show up in KRE. It is a financial product, a financial company, so it will you know, be part of XLF, the financial sector, but more mixed. Okay, so we got mixed information, but yes, Berkshire Hathaway did do some buying and selling. I next want to move, uh, I next want to move to Taiwan. Now, the reason I wanted to show Taiwan was a couple of reasons. Number one, Berkshire got completely out of their Taiwan semiconductor position, TSM. They completely sold it. And I just saw this on Twitter, was it yesterday, two days ago? The US will soon provide significant additional defense assistance to Taiwan. So how do you know if Taiwan's going to war or if China's going to war with Taiwan? You're gonna tell, or the tell will be in either TSM falling Okay, or the tracking symbol for Taiwan EWT. It's it's one of the tracking symbols, and I'll get to that in a moment. But here's Taiwan Semiconductor. I don't see a war happening anytime soon. Uh, yes, Taiwan TSM is below that, but they're fine. Yes, they're not doing as good as Nvidia, um, but this does not look like this. I mean, look, Taiwan Semiconductor is basically the Taiwanese stock market. Let me bring up EWT, which is a tracking symbol for Taiwan. Not too dissimilar. Uh, Taiwan basically is in a sideways channel right now, kind of redundant. I think all channels are sideways, but it's in a channel just moving sideways. Certainly if you see the price of EWT break above, say call it 46 bucks for easy math, uh, there's no war happening with China and Taiwan. That's what's one of the nice things about looking at price charts and really following price. It really makes sure it keeps your retirement money on the right side of the market. 
Okay, the last thing I want to talk about is just Sam Zell. He died. To, I didn't even know he died today until I was putting my video together. I was actually listening to a podcast of his yesterday from like a year ago. So really, really random. Um, he, he died today at, at 81. And in the podcast I was listening to, I learned that he took over EQC. His company took over EQC. It's the red line on the screen. Um, Commonwealth. Um, it was a, it's a publicly traded REIT. Uh, before he bought it, it was called Commonwealth REIT. And then after he bought it, they changed it to Equity Commonwealth. By the way, that doesn't really matter. But the symbol is EQC. It's the red line. And I'm comparing that against VNQ, which is, I think, the largest REIT ETF. It's pretty big. And this is just simply showing you from the peak of the market of 2022. So January 1st, 2022, also known as the beginning of last year, the REIT he had is up about 2% over the last 18 months. And VNQ, which again, think of it as the S&P 500 um, for REITs is down about 27%. He said on this podcast that when they bought it, they um, Commonwealth, had about 145 properties. It's like, that's that's a lot of properties. I'm gonna get out of the price chart. 145 properties. And the first thing Sam Zell did was, or, and then kept doing, he sold 141 of those properties. They He took over, his company took over in 2014. And for the next seven years, he just kept getting rid of properties, getting rid of properties. I'm sure he sold a lot of them to B-REIT, Blackstone, and other non-tradable REITs. And, he said that the the prices he was getting, the prices he was getting for these REITs were just in, uh, for these properties were just insane. And what I like about Sam and his approach is he's okay being how do I say it? he's okay being right, but maybe not having the best performance. Now I showed you a moment ago the last eighteen months the REIT he ran was greatly outperforming VNQ. There were periods where it underperformed, but he had much lower volatility. Uh, and that was really interesting how he approached REITs. Again, he's been doing this since the 70s, maybe the 60s. He was born in 1941. So yeah, he probably started in he started in college at University of Michigan. He, he managed the building he was in. So yeah, he started in, that would be the 50s, something maybe 59, early 60s, he started getting into real estate. So there's not many people on the planet who are probably better at real estate than him. And he passed away today, Thursday, the 18th. So let me tie everything together. The, the market continues to give mixed messages, right? The NASDAQ's up 27% for the year, but the Dow Jones is only, I did this even though it's up 1% for the year. Um, inverted yield curve, really bad, really bad. Every inverted yield curve since 1945 has led to a recession. Recessions are bad, whether they're mild, medium, hard, soft, whatever. They're not good for the economy. They're not good for the stock market. And yet you've got the NASDAQ going up and up 27% this year. Now, remember, it was down 35% last year. So you often see the symbols that fall the hardest go up the fastest. So still we have mixed messages. The market is still below its overhead resistance in January from January 1st of last year. And it comes down to your approach. What is your approach to make sure you retire strong? It's not the symbols and it's not your age. It is your approach. And the approach we use at Fearless Wealth is to align money to the market, right? So if the market's going up and it is about 85% of the time, then you wanna be in the market because that's the most stable, safe place to be. And then there's the other 15% of the time, which we are in now. By the way, yields are only inverted 15% of the time. So yields are not inverted that often and they are inverted right now. And every inversion of the yield curve that's happened since 1945 has led to a recession. We don't know when, you know, we don't know when it's gonna start. We don't know how long it's gonna go. We don't know how deep it's going to be, and we don't know how bad it will affect the stock market. There was a mild recession in 2001. Stock market fell. The S&P fell 50%. The Nasdaq fell 83. We had a horrible recession in 2008. The S&P fell 
55%, and the NASDAQ fell 50%. So hard recession, not as bad for the NASDAQ, mild recession, much worse for the NASDAQ, and for the S&P, about the same. So soft, medium, hard landing, that actually doesn't matter to the market. All in all, you want to be more defense. Doesn't mean be an ostrich and put your head in the ground and forget everything and just be 100% in cash. It means be opportunistic and have different approaches that can take advantage of what's going on, which we do. If you want to look at your portfolio and do an x-ray and kind of show you where you might be leaking, almost every portfolio we've ever looked at in the last 24 years has about a missing 35,000 per year per million dollars. That's a lot also known. Literally, there's $35,000 leaking out of the portfolio per million per year. You can check out our portfolio x-ray in the description. Thanks everyone for being in my world. Let me know where you think I got it right, where you got it wrong. Someone got upset because I always say pre-COVID high and they're like, it's not a political thing. It was COVID. That was the pre-COVID high. We had the worst stock market fall ever in 30 days because of COVID and shutting it down. This is not a political thing. Um, every drop has one and no one, you know, calls a drop really based on the year. There's usually a term around it. But anyway, leave a comment, subscribe, <laughs> check the yes, do the things that YouTube um, likes you to do. But that helps out this video. Thanks, everybody. And I will see you next week. Okay, bye.